Well, good morning, everyone. The title of the lesson is The Other Prodigal Son. The Other Prodigal Son. Feel free to put in chat who you think I might be referring to because uh, after coming up with that title, I thought, well, there are probably a few other people than who I have in mind that could go by that description, the other prodigal son. Well, Jacob, that would be a good guess. Uh, now, when you hear the prodigal son, Cain, that would be another good guess. When you hear the prodigal son, your immediately goes to the familiar. You might even think that the term prodigal son is actually in the Bible because you've heard of it so many times, but it's not. You might even think that the word prodigal means returns because the prodigal son returned to the father. Well, while it's used that way colloquially today, originally the term prodigal does not mean or did not mean returning. So what does it mean? Pat said a spendthrift. The word prodigal means somebody that is wasteful. An excessive spender, as has been put in chat. Now, let's apply this idea of a wasteful son to the other prodigal son, the elder brother in the parable of the prodigal son. You see, the elder brother had also received his inheritance in promise. Get your Bibles out, please, and uh, just search with me. We're going to look at Luke chapter 15 and verse 31, where the father said, Son, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. So, just like the younger son received his inheritance and went away, the older son kept his inheritance and promise and stayed behind. Now, look at it like this. We also have received our inheritance and promise already. Uh, if not in promise, in some ways, we've inherited it in a limited form. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 11, in him, we all have also received an inheritance. The reason why I make that connection is I want us to possibly consider whether or not sometimes we are the elder brother. So how did the older brother, the older son, waste what was his. I suggest to you that he uh, lived a different type of riotous living. The word riotous is used in uh, verse 30 in some translations. Here it says uh, the older son is talking about the younger son, but when this son of yours came, notice he doesn't say, but when this brother of mine, but when this son of yours came, who has devoured your assets with prostitutes, you slaughter the, the fatted calf for him. Well, are we ever guilty of living a different type of riotous living? Or are we ever guilty of devouring the assets that God has given us? Well, what wild type of life did the older son live? Now, here's where we get personal, people. Look at verse 28. But he replied to his father, look, I have been slaving many years for you, and I've never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me a goat so I could celebrate with my friends. Now, I tried to read that with the tone of anger. Being angry is a type of wild living. Exclusion, verse 28. Then he became angry and didn't want to go in. Are we ever guilty of excluding somebody for whatever reasons? How about exaggerated goodness? Verse 29. But he replied to his father, look, 
I have been slaving many years for you. Slaving, this translation says. And I have never disobeyed your orders. Kind of exaggerated goodness there, isn't it? Self-pity, verse 29. Yet you never gave me a goat. Now, a goat was a lot smaller and a whole lot cheaper than the fatted calf. So we have self-pity. We have jealousy. Verse 30. But when the son of yours came, and then joylessness over a soul that was found. Verse 31. When the father says, son, you're always with me and everything I have is yours. But verse 32. But we had to celebrate and rejoice. Because his brother of yours was dead and is alive again, he was lost and is found. The older brother spent his life wasting the resource of his father's affection and blessings recklessly. In anger, exclusion, exaggerated goodness, self-pity, and jealousy. And we can see how he was just throwing away his father's affection by how quickly he dismisses them by lifting up his own efforts. So both sons went prodigal, but in wildly different ways. Now let's break away from the parable just for a second and look at the Pharisees because they are the elder brother. They had a threefold love affair. Praises of men, Matthew chapter 6, verse 4. Money, Luke 16, 14. And self, Luke 18, 9. And you could see those in the parable that we just looked at. The praises of men. You, you never threw me a party. Money. You never even gave me a goat. But you gave the son of yours, fatted calf, and self. What about me? But amazingly, despite all this, he was not yet lost. Verse 31. You are always with me. In parable form, I believe Jesus is, is extending hope to the scribes and the Pharisees. Problem is that the elder brother did not see his own precarious prodigal situation. As we know from other scriptures, the Pharisees, the elder brother, were lovers of money, self-righteous, and they used their privilege of sitting in Moses' chair actually against others. They used the authority that God gave them to burden other people instead of lightening their load. So when we look at this third parable in Luke chapter 15, it could be called the, the parable of the prodigal son, which it often is. could be called the parable of the two sons. Could even be called the parable of a waiting father. But I think it is provocative to consider calling it the parable of the other prodigal son. But let's just go back to one of those the parable of a waiting father. Who is the true focus of the parable? Is it the younger son? Is it the elder son? Or is it the father? It's probably the father. Maybe we shouldn't say one has more prominence than the other two, but let's look at this a little bit more. Look at verse 1 of chapter 15. All the tax collectors and sinners were approaching to listen to him. The tax collectors and the sinners are the younger son. Listening to him. We're going to see Jesus as the true elder brother. Verse 2. And the Pharisees and the scribes were complaining. They are the elder brother in the parable. They're complaining this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. 
Well, what was going on in the parable of the prodigal son or the other prodigal son? They're eating. And the father welcomed a sinner. Let's look at the other parables in this section. The younger son, it's like the sheep and the coin. The true elder brother is like the shepherd who went to go look for the lost sheep. And like the woman who went looking for the one of her 10 coins that had been lost. Go down to verse 7, though. I tell you in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who don't need repentance. Who's in heaven? Look at verse 10. I tell you in the same way, there is joy in the presence of God's angels over one sinner who repents. Well, who is in the presence of God's angels? We often use verse 10 to show that the angels rejoice over a lost soul that returns. And I have no doubt that they are rejoicing, but in verse 10, there is joy in the presence of God's angels. Who's in the presence of God's angels that has joy? The Heavenly Father. And so we see that corresponding to the Father in the parable. As I was preparing for this lesson, it dawned on me, in a way, the three parables in Luke 15 are, are about how the Pharisees did not evangelize. This goes well with the table talk that Paul gave for the Lord's Supper, because when somebody does fall away, what do they need? They don't just need a pep talk, get back to church. They need the gospel. So when we look at these, these parables, the prodigal son that is the other prodigal son, the elder brother, is the Pharisees who are refusing to evangelize or give good news or hope to the tax collectors and the sinners. Now, using these parables for evangelism is provoking. When we continue to go, the possibilities are actually endless as to what the older brother was thinking. He only came home because he ruined his life. You know what? There's truth to that. Unfortunately, sometimes it takes hitting rock bottom before we can realize there was nowhere else to turn. And it was there all along which way to go. But the elder brother, the other prodigal son, was too high and mighty to see that he had hit a different rock bottom. Timothy Keller said, you can try to escape God as much through morality and religion as through immorality and irreligion. The lesson of the older brother is a much needed one for those of us who have been Christians for most of our life. If we grew up in the church or raised in the church, or I like the phrase, we were raised in the pew. And we think, well, I've never left the father's house. Been going to church my entire life. I got baptized. I'm still going to church. We don't realize that there are different ways that you can leave the house. The younger brother wanted the stuff the father could give him, so he took it and left. The older brother wanted the stuff the father could give him, too, so he stayed. Maybe neither brother valued the father for the father's sake, but merely treated him as a means to their selfish ends. So while being very different in their methods, the hearts of the two prodigal sons, the older and the younger, were actually very similar. You see, the young son desired 
benefits without responsibilities, verses 11 through 12. Unrestrained access to life's experiences, verses 13 and 14. And to avoid humbling himself when in the wrong, verses 15 through 19. And the older son desired to put his father under obligation to him, verse 29. To have first place or exclusive regard from his father, verse 30. So I hope that you can see that the prodigal son had a prodigal brother. And one thing that strikes me is the unspoken ending of the story, where the elder brother with the bad attitude towards the younger brother, in the end, will take the true elder brother, Jesus Christ, and put him to death. What's our one takeaway point? Stated in different ways, you don't have to leave home to lose your way. You don't have to leave home to, to become a prodigal son. Self-deception is believing that you're okay when in reality you're not. And you don't need to physically leave the church to spiritually leave the church. What's our application in action? You've heard me say Jesus is the true elder brother. We can follow in his footsteps and go after those that are prodigal. The elder son never left the father, though, in the parable and always had access to the father's physical blessings. But what he forgot was brotherly love. He argued in defense of his emotions due to the fact that he was faithful to the father and the work that he had performed. I've often preached this message and uh, concluded with this thought. What would a good brother have done? You see, that's what this story is missing. And that's who Jesus is, a good brother. A good older brother would have paced the floor just like his father did, discontent to conduct business as usual with an arrogant good riddance. A good brother would have said, oh, forget it. I, I can't stop thinking about him as he saddled up his, his horse or his, his camel. A good brother would have scoured the countryside high and low looking for his brother. And when he found him, a good brother would have paid any price to bring him home. A good brother, even had it come to this, would have died on the cross to set his brother free. Where's the gospel in this? It should not go without notice that although I've never noticed it before, the father goes out of the house to reach both sons. Now we focus on the father waiting and looking. And we see in verse 20, so he got up and went to his father. But while the son was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran or threw his arms around his neck and kissed him. So the father left the house to welcome back the younger prodigal son. What about the older prodigal son? Verse 25, now his older son was in the field. As he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he summoned one of the servants, questioning what these things meant. Well, your brother is here, he told him. And your father has slaughtered the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and didn't want to go in. So his father came out and pleaded with him. I never noticed that before. The father goes out of the house to reach both his sons. Being in the father's house kind of reminds me of Jesus. 
when he was a child, Luke chapter two, verse 49. His parents didn't know where he was. And he said, why were you searching for me? Didn't you know that it was necessary for me to be in my father's house? So ironically, this parable begins with the younger son on the outside and ends with the older brother on the outside, refusing to go in to his father's house because of who else was in there. Someone observed concerning C.S. Lewis' book, The Great Divorce, that it discussed the many who were willing to choose hell out of disgust for the way that God chose to conduct his affairs. So on Judgment Day, will we argue like the elder brother about all we have done? Or will we be like the younger son and say, I have sinned. I'm not worthy to come in. I hope this has been a thought-provoking, maybe heart-wrenching way to look at this parable about the prodigal son, the other prodigal son, and the father of prodigal sons. We will now have our closing prayer.